Whither shall I follow, follow, follow? Whither shall I follow, follow thee? To the greenwood, to the greenwood, to the greenwood, greenwood. Welcome back, everyone. It has been longer than a hot minute since we've been together. So thanks for hanging in with me and thanks for coming back. So you know what happens when you leave a project hanging around on protectors for longer than a hot minute? You wind up with a UFO. If you're new here, my name is Maddie. I am the Pagan Next Door. We started this project quite a while ago. So what happens when you put something down for a while and then you have to pick it up again? Well, you have to play detective for a little bit first. You have to figure out where have I been so that you know where am I going? Kind of like the way we practice. So let's take a look at this mundane example. Flip the camera and I'll be right back with you. So this is the piece as it stands now. Let's take a look at what we have so we can figure out where we've been. We know that this is our working edge because our cable is still attached and we have the live tail that's attached to this last loop. So this is where we wound up. Where did we start? For that, we spin it around and take a look. We know the bag is going to fold here. So we've got at least half of it done. We've got the top band in the, oh, sorry, noisy neighbors. We have the top band in this gray garter stitch. We worked our eyelets. We worked the stockinette, the body of the bag, and we finished the garter stitch in gray that's going to fold and create the bottom of the bag. So following that, we know we have two sections left to do on this end. We need to do the next blue stockinette stitch section and this time we have to end with those eyelets not begin with them because we want them to line up with the front as we continue and then we'll top it off with the gray garter so let's get a little closer and see what this middle section has to tell us coming in real close let's take a good look at what we have so each of the stitches if we follow up a line forms a little upside down teardrop a little hot air balloon we want to count those I like to count with my needle tip right in the center of them so one and I can feel it go over two goes over the base and into three, four, five, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and hidden here, right up against the gray, is 26, the 26th blue stitch is wrapped around the gray. So we know we have 26 stitches. We know we left room for these eyelets. So where do these eyelets actually land? Well, I can see number 26 is wrapped around the gray. Number 25 is huge. So I know that we placed it two stitches away from the gray border. So we're gonna have to come up to 24 before we start our eyelets. 
So with that in mind, I am going to swap out these little feet that protect my work so it doesn't fall off the cable in case I leave it for, you know, a year and a day. And I'll be right back with you so we can start our journey as well. I have my yarn, I have my tips attached. I'm going to make sure that my tail is on the needle when I attach the new color. And now there's one thing we have to be very careful of here. We can easily make the mistake of starting on the wrong side. If you're looking at the knit side, which I am, these are the flat stitches, not the ridges of the purl, then I have to make that match on the other side. Ah, oh, sweet summer and the sound of motorcycles. I have to make sure I continue to match on the other side. So my first row of blue is going to be knit. We start with three deep breaths. And as we start to work and start to feel the rhythms, of the needle and the yarn, we can let our mind open and wander and begin our journey today. And find yourself at the stream. Nine stepping stones across to the other world. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Step onto the other side where your guide meets you. Take a breath to ground yourself there. And oh, a familiar sound. Say hello to the salmon. Find some hazelnuts on the ground, toss them one, and grab a handful for this new journey. You and your guide walk toward your grove where your saplings are starting to really fill out in the warm sun. They're now reaching over your head. They're still young, so you ask your guide how to protect them against any storms that may pop up. I'm glad you asked, they say, because protection is what we're going to explore today. Let me call a friend to help us out. They step a little away from you, put their fingers to their lips, and blow a loud series of whistles. You look around and immediately hear something coming through the brush of the forest pretty quickly. Within seconds, you are greeted by a large deer hound, tail wagging and wriggling to greet your guide. Its size is intimidating, but the dog seems friendly enough. Your guide puts a hand on your shoulder and you feel yourself changing as you both become dogs too. The world is so different now. Things look different from this perspective. But what's most impressive are all the smells. What are these scents? The deer hound carefully sniffs the nearest of the trees and you reach out and sniff the same spot. Hmm. There's something familiar about this scent. You've smelled this before. And as you're puzzling this out, you hear something in the distance. It's amazing how much more you can hear now too. A steady clip, clop, clip. Oh, the horse. That's what the scent is, it's horse. Now the deer hound moves to the next tree and jumps up, leaning a front paw on the trunk and stretching up to sniff at the lowest branch. They move aside to let you try. After a couple of attempts, you use your front paws to balance as you stretch your nose up and take a sniff. This scent is familiar too. Is it Raven? Listening again, you hear their unmistakable call. <laughs> it's Raven. You're feeling pretty good when you follow the deer hound to the third tree. And this time, the deer hound sits and looks back and forth between you and the tree, as if telling you, try this one on your own. You sniff high. You sniff low, there's horse, there's raven. Wait, a new one, <gasps> the boy. Now you are wagging and dancing around like the puppy you are here. This is easy. The deer hound looks at the next tree and you race toward it. Here's boy and horse. 
You race to the next one and jump up, excited to sniff a raven. Yep, there they are. On to the next tree. There's a new one, a very familiar one. It's, it's the deer hound. They've rubbed against the tree to see if you catch it. You can hardly contain yourself as you race to the next tree. You're halfway around the circle now, and something stops you in your tracks. This tree has a scent you don't recognize. You start to back away, but the deer hound nudges you to go on. You look at your guide, and they nod their head, encouraging you to keep going. What is this? It's a complex scent. Is it more than one? There's a piece that smells similar to the boy. That is man, you hear from behind you. Your guide has confirmed one part of this scent. But what is the other part? It's strong and it teases at your nostrils, almost burning, but not unpleasant. The deer hound nudges you and starts to sniff at the ground. You try too. So many smells here, but yes, there it is again. The man and the other scent. You follow the deer hound, your guide behind you. They're following the faint trail of the man. That seems steady, but the other scent comes and goes. Is it something that hops? Rabbit? Hare? No. Does it fly ahead and land? No. You continue to follow the scent and realize that it's getting stronger. Are you getting closer to the man and the mystery? Now you're getting excited and you hardly realize that you've overtaken the deer hound and your guide, although they're following you closely. Through the woods and toward a small trail, the scent keeps getting stronger. It seems as if this pair walk this little path often. You can sense there are layers of scent here, some older and faded, some fresh and strong. Yes, this pair walks this path regularly. The deer hound gives a little whine and you turn to find they and your guide are now sitting on a patch of soft grass in the shade of a tree that's growing to mark a crossing along this path. You return to join them and sit too. They stretch out and settle to wait. What are we waiting for? Who are we waiting for? The sun and the breeze start to feel so comfortable that you stretch out too, not quite asleep, but dozing lightly. Your eyes close and you take the chance to experience what it feels like to embody dog. You feel the breeze ruffling your fur and the pads of your paws on the grass growing beneath the tree. The breeze brings new scents to your nose and you can hear so many birds and small animals nearby. After a little while, you hear the breathing of the deer hound become slow and deep as they take a nap, secure in your company. You feel your guide edge closer and you hear them as they speak softly to you. The dog is known for being a loyal companion, bringing guidance and protection, and is seen by the Druids as the guardian of the mysteries. In earlier times, Celtic ambassadors were accompanied by canine bodyguards, and the title Ku, the Gaelic name for dog, was given to heroes and kings. Dogs were represented as the companions of Celtic goddesses, often near lakes, pools, and the sea all thought of as gateways to the other world, which they're thought to guard along with crossroads and gateways. You can still find images of dogs on old gravestones since they were believed to guide souls through the other world. One of the most famous Celtic heroes is known as Cuchulain, who earned the title after guarding a household while raising a puppy to replace the guard dog he'd slain while he was still a boy. He became a mighty warrior, but lost his power after eating dog meat roasted on a spit made of rowan just like the tree above us. Suddenly, the deer hound's head pops up and you hear a sound come from deep in his throat. Sitting up, you sniff the air. The man and the mysterious scent are coming. The deer hound starts to trot down the path toward the man, but you feel your guide's hand, quite human now, holding you back. You hear them whisper, go human, and find that you can do that immediately. Your guide sits down at the base of the tree and leans against his trunk, so you do the same. You hear the man call out, Hello, Ku, and you glance toward your guide. As Ku and the man come into view, you stand to greet them. Are these people friends of yours? The man extends his hand and you take it. Tell him who you are and that you're here to learn about protection. Show him your work 
and tell him it's a bag meant to create a portable sacred space. Oh, it's like my crane bag, he says. You notice the bag that hangs at his side. What's a crane bag, you ask? He says, the crane bag takes its name from the legend of Mananan MacLear, the sea god who made the original bag from the skin of a crane who had once been a beautiful maiden. She had been turned into a crane by dark magic, and she had taught Manana MacLear, whose totem animal was the crane, how to make a magical bag from her hide. It was said that when the tide was low, the bag appeared empty. But when the tide was high, all the treasures inside it were visible. Bags used to hold magical belongings are sometimes still referred to as crane bags. So, if you create yours with intent, it will serve you well and keep your magical items safe and charged. It's up to you to decide whether the intent is to keep the magical energy in and your items charged or to keep any negative energy out. A sudden movement of the man's staff catches your attention and you take a quick step back as you realize you're looking at what seems to be a dragon. Oh, my dragon energy helps me keep this area safe. It's the energy in my staff and I always carry it with me as I walk the boundary of this safe and sacred space. Who here tells me that you have a keen nose and that you are respectful of the boundaries, so you have nothing to fear from the dragon? They're just reminding me that I need to complete my rounds. You look into the eyes of the dragon and suddenly are inspired to speak to them directly. Dragon, would you be willing to charge my bag with some of your protective energy? You watch the dragon's eyes slowly close and you hold the bag and the remaining yarn out. You hear the dragon exhale as two thin tendrils of energy wind their way toward the bag and appear to weave in and out of the fabric following your stitches. You feel a pleasant sensation in your hands as you hold it, building as it reaches into each stitch and the ball of yarn that's still attached to your work. You feel the energy recede as the dragon begins a slow inhale. How can I thank you and the dragon, you ask the man. All I have is a pocket full of hazelnuts. Oh, they'll do just fine, he replies. You reach into your pocket and hand him a bunch of hazelnuts. He holds one up in front of the dragon and you watch as it seems to lose solidity and become a smoky outline of a hazelnut. He tosses this up in the air and the dragon gracefully catches it. You notice the slightest hint of a smile on the dragon's face and watch as their energy fades back into the grain of the wood of the man's staff. Good luck with the rest of your project. Come back and visit us anytime. The man calls out as he resumes his walk. Coming, Koo? Wait, wait. I have enough hazelnuts for you too, Koo. Thanks for spending some time with me today. You hold out a few in your hand and feel the giant deer hound take each one gently from your palm. With a big tail wag, Koo bounds off after the man. You feel the presence of your guide beside you and turn toward them. Time to check your work. It's also time for you to return to your side of the stream and concentrate on your eyelets. Follow me. In a flash, your guide becomes a raven and you follow them into the air. In a matter of seconds, you both land at the water's edge where the salmon jumps up to greet you. Always good to see you, they say, as you toss the remaining few hazelnuts to the salmon, who catches them one after the other with ease. You turn toward your guide and share a hug. I'll get right on those eyelets, you say. Try not to stay away so long next time, okay? Is the response you get as you start to step toward the nine stepping stones and make your way across back to the mundane world. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. And with a final step, you feel yourself standing in our world. Take three grounding breaths, and let's finish those eyelets. Alrighty, so let's check what we've done. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four is on the needle. The next thing for us to count is where we're going to place the nine eyelets. So let's zoom in and take a look. I'm starting from the way we started it. So this is not my working end. This is the original cast on. These were the first eyelets that we put on. So let's take a look. There are two stitches here and the hole. So two of them have to come together. We're going to do one and the eyelet. Then we've got one, two, three, four and five will gather around the eyelet. One, two, three, four and five will gather to make the eyelet. So we have our plan. So let's go. One stitch on the edge, yarn over, two together. That starts our pattern. Now we're going to go one, two, three stitches, a yarn over, and we're going to knit four and five together. One, two, three stitches, yarn over, knit the two, four, and five together. There are five stitch repeat. So one, two, three, yarn over, and we're knitting four and five, knit those two together. One, oops, two, three, yarn over, that makes the big loop, the big hole. Four and five are the knit two together. One, two, three, yarn over, knit two together. One, two, three, yarn over, knit two together. And this time, the two stitches on the edge are all the way to the left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine eyelets, just like the other side. We've got a wider band on one edge and it's opposite on the, the other end here. Our wider band is over here. So when we bring the two together, the two sides will sort of balance out. Alrighty, one row back. That's a straight purl. Doesn't matter the size of the stitch. We're just gonna purl our way back. Two, three, when you get to those yarn overs, just purl them like a regular stitch and keep going. And there's our first eyelet. Work your way back. And let's bid our farewells. Thanks for your patience and for coming back to this project. We have one more episode to go before we land this plane, or should I say aircraft? Hmm, nope. It's a UFO no longer. It is now a WIP. It has returned to being a work in progress, like all of us. If you enjoyed yourself today, and if you want to see when we get to the final episode, which I'm promising will not be a year and a day from now, <laughs> make sure you hit the subscribe button. Come on along. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I thank you again, and see you next time. Tree. 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 Tree.
Position of the green wood, position of the green wood, position of the green wood.